Husbands, if your wife is here, give her a kiss and you may be seated. And uh, let's open up our Bibles to the Gospel of, of Mark chapter 14. The Gospel of Mark chapter 14. I'm going to tell you, uh, normally, normally, I always brag about 8 a.m. service. Whenever I, I'm like, husbands, you know, if your wife is here, give her a kiss. And those, those guys normally are the most uh, romantic. But I don't know what happened today. 10 a.m. I had to tell him, calm down, we're in church. Like, I mean, I was like, hey, you guys must have gotten Starbucks or something this morning. I don't know what's going on. But, uh, man, the year is going by fast. It is going by fast. And next week, uh, we will be uh, celebrating uh, Resurrection Sunday. Um, and so I, I know that, that some of you, you're in a rush to get to the park and get a nice, you know, place where, you know, get some barbecue and stuff like that. But I really want to encourage, I mean, if, if there's a Sunday that we don't miss, it, it should be next week. I really want to encourage you to come next week, bring your family. And um, I'm going to be teaching on uh, why we believe in the resurrection, why we believe in the resurrection. Not just that we believe in the resurrection or we should believe in the res resurrection of Jesus Christ, but why we believe in the resurrection. So I really want to encourage you to come um, next Sunday, 12 p.m. Bring someone, bring your one, invite your one, right? Mark chapter 14, let's go ahead and read uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. Let me pause right there. Jesus tells him, sit here while I go and pray. Like, more than the word Christians um, is the word disciple used in the Bible for the followers of Jesus Christ. More than the word Christians... The word disciple is what's used for the followers of Jesus Christ. And you and I are disciples of Jesus. And a disciple of Jesus is someone that follows the teachings of Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ. Right? So we follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ. So we don't just follow like what he said, but we follow what did he do? How did he act? How did he react? And, and one thing that you'll learn about Jesus, if you take time to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is sort of like the, the biography of Jesus, is that over and over you'll see that he was constantly praying. And he's constantly praying. My message isn't about prayer, but I, but I just feel like it's very important for me to emphasize this. Over and over he's constantly praying, and this should tell us that if prayer was important in the life of Jesus, it ought to be important in our lives. Right? If prayer was important to Jesus, the Son of God, Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? Um, it should be important in our lives. And, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the Bible says that it, and this shall be called a house of prayer. This is a house of prayer. Therefore, we should be people of prayer, right? You should be a man of prayer. You should be a woman of prayer. We, we should be people of prayer. And so, um, you know, we're, I, I just said the year is going by fast, but we're still fresh in the year. And if, if, if you uh, set New Year's resolution, one New Year's resolution you should have, and I should have, we should have, is to be more people of prayer, right? Let, let's get deeper into prayer. All right. Anyways, back to the verse, and then we'll get to the teaching. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. Verse 33. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. Verse 4. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. And what does it say? He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. 36. Abba, Father, he cried out. Now, Abba, it's kind of like saying like Daddy, right? Um, with, with, with Rebecca and Raquel, uh, they, they call me Papi. And, um, and so I'm always telling them, Team Papi or Team Mommy? And of course, they, they, they're Team Papi, right? And, and Raquel, I taught her to say, and she, she'll, she'll tell Nayeli, Team Papi, and she'll look at Nayeli and she'll say, No, 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 Mommy, right? You know, like that, right? But that's sort of what Abba is. It's that, that intimate father and child, father and son, father and daughter, you know, term, endearing term. Abba, Father, Jesus cries out. Everything is possible for you. And then he says, Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Right. Abba, Father, 
Please, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Let's go back to verse 33. Let me get some water real quick. Speaking of Jesus, it says, he became deeply troubled and distressed. Verse 34, he told his Peter, James, and John, he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Right. Last year, um, I want to say it was about September, we started studying the Gospel of Mark. We, September, October, we took a pause in November, December, pause in January, a little bit of pause in February, picked up about mid-February, and, and then we continued. I kept saying, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best that we will finish Easter Sunday with Easter. And, and so, so far, we're going pretty good. But when you read the Gospel of Mark, and those of you who, who walked with us um, since last year studying the Gospel of Mark, we're talking about Jesus here, right? There's a storm. His disciples are all afraid, freaking out, thinking they're going to die. Jesus calms the storm, right? The scripture says all power and authority has been given unto him, all right? So he has all power and authority. Uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, we studied a portion where Jesus came down from the mountain, the mountain transfiguration, and there was a, a child that was demon-possessed, and his disciples couldn't help. And Jesus comes and rebukes that demon, and the child is, is free, right? So there's a, there's a person, who has, there's a, a being, a man, uh, all man, all God, who has all power and all authority, has the power and authority to rebuke, bind and rebuke spirits, demons, however you want to call it, has the power and the authority to calm the storms, to calm the winds, to calm the waves. Yet we see something here that we never see in any other part of the Gospels. He says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Verse 33, it says that he became deeply troubled and distressed, right? And this word for distressed, it means to have something heavy on you, right? And so he's carrying this heavy burden, right? Troubled means to be um, overcome with, with horror, right? So, so he's seeing, he's sensing, he's feeling, and he's seeing something horrific that he's about to go through. Um, 2020, 2021 for our, our church was a, a really difficult time. Um, uh, many uh, uh, families from our church, many present in this service, um, lo lost a loved one. And, and, it, and it, it's always very uh, difficult. Now, I was, um, you know, I was I, I often mention whenever I'm at a funeral that we were not created to die. Uh, God creates Adam and Eve, puts them in the garden. In the middle of the garden are two trees. And God tells Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree you want. Just don't eat from the tree of wisdom of good and evil. The day you eat from that tree, surely you will die. Uh, Adam and Eve disobey, extend their hand. They eat from that tree. Uh, God kicks them out of the garden and says, let's get them out before they extend their hand and eat from the tree of life and become like us and live forever. And that's how death was introduced to humanity. And over, over time, though it's not natural for us, we've accepted it to a certain point. Um, my mom is here, and when we were kids, um, her, great, her grandparents, my great-grandparents, they lived in Victoria, Texas. And um, so when we were in middle school, my mom would tell us, like, spring break, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, uh, New Year's vacation, um, and, and then the summer, my mom would say, we got to go to Victoria. This could be the last time you're going to see your great-grandparents. And so we would go sixth grade, go to Victoria. Seventh grade, we have to go to Victoria. This could be the last time you might see your grandparents, so great-grandparents. So there we go, seventh, eighth grade. I was in high school. And uh, my mom, all through high school, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, spring break, summer vacations, we need to go to Victoria. This could be the last time you're going to see your great-grandparents, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. I get to college. We need to go to Victoria. This could be the last, last time you might see your great-grandparents. Uh, college, university, 
master's degree. My mom's like, we need to go to Victoria. This 98 years old. Both my great grandparents, my great grandfather, my great grandmother lived to be 98 years. They were like, peace, we're tired of this, we're out, right? You know, like, and and that's the closest family member to us that I've had pass away up to now. And I thought, I always thought, like, man, when that time comes, because we knew, right, eventually the time's going to come. When that time comes, like, like, man, how am I going to feel? And I remember I, I didn't cry. I remember, like, like it, was, it was because it was so expected, right? It was so expected. Like, like this is going to happen that, that it was almost like, you know, and I don't mean this in any disrespect, but it was almost like a yara tiempo type of feeling, right? You know, like, I'm sure they were like, you know, Lord, please take us. You know, at a certain point, they were, you know, ready to go. In 2020, the first funeral I did, it was right when COVID was happening, COVID restrictions happened. First funeral I did wasn't because of COVID. Um, it was, a, it was a, a little boy. They, um, they never really knew what happened. He just started feeling sick. They took him to the hospital and they, they never, and he ended up passing away. And his, his grandparents were actually at the service um, here last night. And um, he was eight years old, eight year old boy. And I don't know how his grandparents found out. I don't know if they were there. I don't know if they got a call, a text message. I don't know. But I can imagine when they first found out that, that their grandson passed away, it's like a, a punch to the gut, right? Like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like this nauseating feeling, right? Like, like you almost want to throw up, right? Like you just, so this is, this is what Jesus is, is feeling, right? He became deeply troubled and distressed he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. This is what Jesus was going through. Now, in this time period, 2,000 years ago, people who study these things, you know, they, they say that like the Greek heroes, when they were confronting death, like, like, like Socrates, right? They, they made him drink something that, 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 uh, to kill himself. When they confronted death, they were, they were calm, they were cool, they were cold. Not, I will not even say cool, they were cold. They were stoic, right? They were stoic, like they were just like, whatever. You know, like, like I don't care, whatever, right? They say that there were certain um, Jewish uh, men that during this time period were killed because of their faith or whatever. And they say that, man, that they were like, like courageous, they were hot-headed, like, man, we don't care, you can kill us, it doesn't matter, you know, we know our God, right? And, and, in the book of Acts, you can read um, about the first Christian martyr. A martyr is someone that dies for, for their faith. The first Christian martyr was a man named Stephen. And Stephen was dragged out of a city and then he was stoned to death. And the Bible says that as they were stoning um, uh, Stephen to death, that he looked up and he says, I see the son of man, and he's standing, right? He's like, I see my Lord, I see Jesus, and he's standing. Even in that, he's like preaching the gospel, right? Confronting death, some are just cold, some are calm, cool, and collected, some are like, just, man, let's, I don't care, let's do this, right? But we see Jesus about to confront death. I mean, the hour is there, right? He is in the hour, about to get arrested, um, about to get beaten, about to have his part of his beard torn off, get punched, crown of thorns on, disrobed. In other words, they, they leave him naked, about to get scourged, uh, you know, almost die by being scourged, have to carry his own cross, and then die the horrific death, the, the, a form of terrorism, what we call today crucifixion. I mean, none of us have even witnessed a crucifixion because it's illegal. It's so horrible. He's about to confront all of that. And it says he became troubled and distressed. And he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Why? Why, why, did, why did some of the Greeks, some of the Jews, and even some of the Christians die almost calmer than Jesus? Because he was about to face something that no one else had faced. He was about to face the wrath of God, right? The wrath of God. Now, when you say, well, you know, people have faced the wrath of God. Yeah, but remember this, okay? Remember something here. We, like, we live in a society where we don't memorize, like, we don't memorize poems and we don't really memorize 
scripture. We should memorize scripture, but we really don't, right? So there's a few scriptures that some of you uh, uh, might have memorized. So, so I'm going to help you out. I'm, I'm going I'm to throw like a, like a softball underhanded, right? You know, see if we can knock this one out of the park, okay? So I'm going to start you off and, and you, you're going to help me finish, right? You know, so here, here we go. Like, the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. There you go, right? You know, uh, th- when I think about that verse, you know, so when my mom and my dad, you know, they first got together before they got married, um, you know, my mom, she was raised uh, in, in a Christian family. My dad, he didn't know nothing about nothing. And he, he's out partying and doing, you know, things he shouldn't have been doing. And so my mom, when she would go to church in those days, back in the 70s, especially Hispanic churches, they were small, like, you know, 50. You had 50 people. That was a big church, right, in a Hispanic church, right? And so it was like 20, 25 people, 50 people. And so my mom would sit in the back because she never knew when my dad was going to show up, right? Because all of a sudden he'd show up and he didn't show up, you know, in the right frame of mind, if you know what I mean, right? And so... Uh, my, in those days, the, the pastor used to stand up and he would say, like, does anyone have a song they would like to sing? And so, like, the hermana would pass and sing, you know, todo desafinada, you know, like she, you know, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't keep, a, couldn't keep the, the tone to save her life. But she would say, you know, well, don't listen to my voice. Listen to the words because it's for the honor and glory of God, right? You know, like they would say stuff like that, right? And then someone would say a poem. And then, you know, and so the pastor says, does anybody know a, a, a Bible verse? Anybody want to share a, a Bible verse? And my dad raises his hand. And, and my mom goes like this to the pastor. Like, he don't know nothing. Like, boom, boom, boom. And so the pastor's like, oh, look, this young man here, you know, what would you like to say? And so my dad says, uh, my mom can correct me if I'm wrong, but he says something like, the Lord is my shepherd and God is love. Right? You know, like that. <laughs> the, the, instead of the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd and God is love. Right? So I'm going to throw you another softball. All right? I just helped you out here. I, I just need you to finish this one for me, all right? God is, I just told you the answer right now, right? With my dad's story, right? God is, love. Love. okay, God is love, right? The sun has existed for all of eternity, right? Not the sun, S-U-N, the sun, S-O-N, the son of God has existed for all of eternity. Some people believe Jesus came into existence 2,000 years ago when he was born and laid in that manger. No, no, no. Jesus existed before that, right? That's when 2,000 years ago he took on flesh, right? Emmanuel, God amongst us, became a man, all God and all man. But before that, he already existed. The Gospel of St. John starts like this. It says, in the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus. And the Word was with God. And then he says, and the Word was God. And then John goes on to say that everything was created through this word and nothing that that was created wouldn't have been created if not for this word, right? So Jesus has always, right, the Son has always been with God. Now, if God is love, right, that's what you said, God is love, before the creation of man, who did God love? Well, maybe you say, well, he loved the angels. Okay. Well, the angels were created, so before the creation of angels, who did God love? So I'll tell you. The Father loved, because God is love. He has to love someone. The Father loves the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son loves the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son, right? So before anything was created, God's love. God is love. Not, not God was love or God became love. That's, that's who God is. God is love. So all what Jesus has known for all of eternity is the love of the Father. But then this hour comes and he's, he's staring down the barrel, as we would say. He's confronting the hour, not just where he's going to go through immense physical suffering, but he's also about to suffer spiritually for the first time where he has always had a relationship of love with the Father, for the first time, he is about to endure the wrath of the Father. The anger of the Father. For a moment, he's going to be separated from the Father because the wages of sin, the death of sin, is death. And death means separation. And so when he takes on our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions, he becomes separated from the Father. So he sees the wrath of God, and he says in verse 36, Abba, Father, 
everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. He's not just talking about the physical suffering. He's talking about what's about to happen in the spirit world, right? Where all this time, all of eternity, he's known the love of God. He's about to experience the wrath of God, right? Now, some might say, well, I don't want to deal with a God of wrath. I don't want to deal with a God that gets angry. I just want a God of love, right? I just want to deal with a God of love. It's get wrath, it get anger, it get hell. No, 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 no. God is love. Like, no, no, I don't want to deal with none of that. You know, judgment and book of life. Like, I don't want to deal with, I just want to deal with a God of love. The, perhaps the, one of the most famous women, and perhaps one of the richest women of the world, many of you heard of her, her name is, Oprah Winfrey. Anybody ever heard of Oprah? All right. O, right? Oprah. Yeah. I'm not asking who's watched the show. I'm just asking who's heard of Oprah. And part of Oprah Winfrey's story, you can look this up. I'm sure there's a video on, on YouTube, so don't, don't take pastor's word for it. Part of Oprah Winfrey's story, she grew up in an evangelical household. They believed in Jesus Christ. And one day she was reading the Bible and she read that God says, I am a jealous God, right? I'm a jealous God. And she said, I don't want to serve a God like that. I don't want to serve a jealous God. Like, I, I want to serve a God of love, but not a, a, a God who is jealous, right? And, and so she strayed from the way. She's, she's not a, she's not a Bible-believing Christian like you. She doesn't have her faith in Jesus Christ like, like you. You keep watching her show. Keep making her richer. Go ahead. And, um, you know, uh, and so anyways, um, she, because she was offended that God is a jealous God, right? Or here, what I'm saying today, God is a God of wrath. Right? He's God of love, but at the same time, he has wrath. He has anger. Okay. I don't know if you know, but last year, 2021, Houston, Texas was ranked the most violent city in America. Houston, Texas. H-Town. Right? Ranked the, the most violent city in America. More violent than New York, more violent than Chicago, more violent than Los Angeles. Not saying that it was by much, right, because those places are still violent, but Houston, Texas was ranked the most violent city in, in America. That makes it one of the most violent cities in the world. Right? We, we need to pray for Houston, right? We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for peace in Houston, amen? Those ranked the most, okay. So you and I, we, we see, I, I don't know how you see the news. I don't... I, you know, we don't get the newspaper and we don't have TV, so I see the news through, through social media, right, when somebody posts something. But um, I'm, I'm going to share something with you. you. Many of you know this story. I think it was like about a month and a half, two months ago, um, this guy, he was at a Chase ATM at night, and someone robbed him. And when they robbed him, he pulled out a gun, and, and the guy took off running, and there was a SUV, and he thought the guy went into the SUV, so he started shooting at this SUV. The SUV had nothing to do with anything. They were just at the ATM themselves, and um, he ended up shooting a little girl that was in the SUV, killing her, right? Anybody hear, hear about that story? Right? See, I'm, Pastor ain't making this up, right? Okay. Now, most of us hear that story, read that story, whatever, however you came across those news, whether it's through TV, newspaper, or, or social. And, and what do you say? You see that and you say, man, that's what? Somebody help me out. What did you say? That's crazy. What else did you say? That's horrible. That's messed up, right? That's what I said. I'm like, man, that's messed up. That's crazy. That's horrible. That's messed up. Like, man, I hope, but some of us said, but man, I hope they get that guy, right? I hope they, they get that guy. And, but then, the next day, we just carry on. Right? The next week, we just carry on. As a matter of fact, most of you here, you didn't even remember about that story other than the fact that I just brought it up right now. But what if that little girl was your niece? or was your daughter or your granddaughter, then what would have been your reaction? You wouldn't just say, man, that's crazy. 
You wouldn't say, man, that's horrible. You wouldn't just say, man, that's messed up. Right? You'd be PO'd. Right? You'd be ticked off. You'd be filled with anger. You'd want wrath. You'd want just, you would demand justice. You, you, would, you would tell the judge, throw the book at that guy. Right? He took an innocent life and a young innocent life. Right? You, you, why? Why would you react differently than how you reacted to this story? L-O-V-E. Because you love your niece, your daughter, your granddaughter, and the offense happened to them that stirs up in you anger and wrath. Well, if God is loving and good, then he must have anger and wrath toward evil, right? Toward whatever assaults his creation. If our heavenly father is loving and good, he must have anger and wrath against what assaults his children, what comes against his children. And in this is where you and I find value. Right? If we served, there's a, there's a portion in scripture that says, if there was another gospel, and then it says, not that there is, <laughs> right? If there was another God, not that there is, but let's just say that there was a God that he was all loving, all loving, no wrath, no anger, all loving. He just loved, 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 loved everybody, loved everything. It's love, peace, peace, peace and love, right? You know, uh, and, uh, and I asked you, does your God love you? And you say, yes, he's all loving, he loves. How much does your God love you? I don't know. Because he loves you the way he loves her, the way he loves him, the way, the way he loves him, the way, right? How do you know that God loves you? Well, let, let me bring it closer to home. Okay. Ask the hermanas, the sisters, does your husband love you? Yes. <laughs> does he love the neighbor? He better not. <laughs> Ah, but you want a husband, you want a God all loving and a husband all loving. But ah, no. All right? No, no, no. The fact that he doesn't love others the way he loves you proves to you, shows to you the value you have for him and how much he loves you. All right? The fact that God hates evil will judge evil. His wrath will come against evil as a reminder that he loves you, right? It is a reminder of the value that you have before him, right? And not only is his wrath a reminder of his love, but the substitute his son came. He didn't send a prophet. He didn't send an angel. But his son came and took his wrath in your place to show you his love. Right? The Bible says we know love because he loved us first. Right? Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to take the wrath of God in your place. Jesus died the death that you and I should have died. He lived a life that you and I couldn't live. And he died the death that you and I should have died. We, we, we deserve to be crucified. I'm not that horrible. The wages of sin is death. Right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We deserve to, to die and spend eternity separated from God. Have that separation. But Jesus came as the Lamb of God and took our place. He, he was our substitute. He took our place. What we should have gotten, he took it for us to show you that God loves you to show you, to demonstrate that God loves you and you're valuable to God. You mean something to God. You mean so much to God that Jesus didn't come and redeem us by paying out money. You, you, um, you ever take your kids to Peter Piper's 
or to It's Pizza, and they play those games and they get tickets. Well, now they don't get tickets. The other day I went to It's and it's just on the card, right? You know, but I was, I was with Rebecca and Rebecca played this game. She hits the jackpot. I'm like, <laughs> and then nothing came out. And I'm like, so I took out my phone and I recorded it, right? I'm like, I'm gonna go redeem a tour for Mika and I'm gonna show the dude like, hey, no, no tickets came out. And then someone's like, no, it, it, it's on the card. I was like, oh, yeah, eso no tiene en mi rancho, right? You know, like, I was like, what the? And so anyways, so you get those tickets and you go and you redeem the prize, right? Cheap, cheap prize. So cheap, you didn't even redeem it with dollars. You redeemed it with what? Tickets. Cheap price. Por eso no tienen un Tesla allí, right? You're not going to go redeem a Tesla there, right? They have cheap prices that they bought at the dollar store, and you spent 50 bucks to get it. It would probably cost them like two bucks, right? Cheap price. With something you've got to pay with money, well, that, that's, that's more valuable, right? Something that, that you've got to pay with something that's even more scarce. Maybe you have to, well, we only accept gold or diamonds. Well, that, man, now we're talking about something maybe even more valuable. Jesus didn't redeem us with cash, with cheap tickets from Peter Piper's Pizza. He didn't redeem us with Bitcoin. Right? Or Dogecoin? No, no, no. He didn't redeem us with gold or silver. Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus redeemed us, saved us, ransomed us by his blood. That means by his life, he died to do it. So you don't think you mean something to God? You, you don't think you mean something to God? Well, you mean something to him. You mean something to him. He didn't send a prophet. He didn't send an angel. He sent his son because you mean something to him. You're valuable to him. Okay. Now, in all of this, not only did God redeem us, but Jesus suffered, right? He suffered. He, he, he's, he's like, Father, take this cup away from me. Uh, verse 33 tells us that he became deeply troubled in distress. Verse 34, Jesus says, my, my, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He sees the wrath. Jesus go, he, 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 he suffers, he sees the wrath. He suffers physically. We understand that with the, uh, being scourged and crucified. He suffered emotionally. His friends and family were like, what are you doing? They abandoned him. Peter, one of his closest friends, was like, I'll be with you till the end. Peter's like, man, the rooster's not even going to crow before you deny me three times. He suffered spiritually because for the first time, he's going to receive the wrath, will be separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit. He suffered. I was uh, reading it, and I, and, I, and I came across something about suffering, and, and, and it describes suffering as the gap between the desires of your heart and the circumstances of your life, right? Suffering is the gap between the desires of your heart and the circumstances of your life, right? So, so you know, right now I'm suffering because my desire, my heart is for my wife and I to be in Hawaii on a hammock, drinking a drink from a coconut, but instead I'm here suffering with you here at Pueblo's Church, you know, like that. I'm just kidding. I'm not suffering here. It is the desire of my heart, but I'm not, we're not suffering. We're, we're good. We're good. Thank you. Anybody want to buy us a cruise ticket, though? I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Anyways, so how, how do people react? When, when someone is suffering, um, someone is suffering, sometimes it's necessary to react by changing your environment, right? Changing the circumstance. Uh, Women, they hook up with the man, and the man is abusive, takes their money, abuses them emotionally, physically. Get out of Dodge. Get, get away from that man. Right? But sometimes there are people that any little suffering, man, they just dart out. 
And, and this happens with men and women, but, but more often, I guess, the experiences with women, that they will be with a man that, that abuses them emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever, and, and any little suffering, boom, they, they dart, they leave, but then they get with another guy that does the same thing. And then, boom, they'll dart, they'll leave, and then they'll get with another guy that does the same thing. Right? This, this, this service um, it comes out live on radio, and, and, and one of our stations covers about seven prisons up there in the Huntsville area. There's a lot of prisoners that, that listen to La Iglesia del Pueblo and to Pueblo's Church. I know because they write me, and people tell me, um, and, uh, and, they'll tell, and the prisoners will tell me, oh, there's a lot of, a lot of us listen to the service here. And, and this is an, an unfortunate situation that happens with a lot of prisoners, is that they'll get out of prison, and within a year, they, they end up back. Why? Because let's just say that they were from, um, let's not go too far. They were, they were from Corpus, right? And in Corpus, they grew up in the hood, and they grew up around a certain type of guys, you know, that were involved in certain type of things. They got in trouble, ended up in the pen. They get out of, 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 of prison, and they're like, man, you know what? I'm not going back to Corpus. I'll move to Pasadena, right? So they end up in Pasadena, and slowly they make their way to the same type of hood and start hanging around with the same type of hoodlums, right? Guys that, you know, vatos, la raza, whatever, that they hung, you know, hung around with back there in Corpus, and all of a sudden they're doing the same thing again, just that they're doing it here in Pasadena, and they go back. Sometimes necessary is change your circumstance. Sometimes it's more than just simply changing your circumstance. Other people react to suffering by suppressing their feelings, right? Suppressing their emotions. Uh, become stoic, become cold, right? Like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Uh, I, know, I know people that that's their attitude. You're like trying to, I don't, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, right? And when you do that, I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes we do have to suppress, you know, our emotions, you know, sometimes you, you just have to suck it up, buttercup, this storm too shall pass, right? But when we live that type of life, I don't care, we become bitter, we don't live out the life that God called you to live out, you're not living what God created you to live. If God is love, he created us to love, and if we become like that, then we're not loving, and um, so, so, so that's not, the, the, you know, that's not necessarily always a good solution. Sometimes it's necessary, but sometimes not a solution. Verse 36. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Jesus is not trying to not save humanity. He's like, if it's possible to save humanity another way, maybe we'd look at that. <laughs> then he says, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Now, in the Bible, the cup often represents... God's wrath. I should have said that at the beginning of the teaching, right? Because I've talked a lot about God's wrath. But that's what the cup represents, God's wrath. So Jesus is saying, Father, take away your wrath from me. Don't let me endure your wrath. I only know your love. Don't let me endure your wrath. But then he changes and he says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Right? He embraces the circumstance. I've got to go through this. I'm going to go through this. He doesn't suppress his feelings. He's, he's pouring out his heart. He's troubled. He's anguished. He's distressed. My soul is crushed to the point of death. He's, he's pouring out his heart. Right. Now, I, I, I want to tell you that um, all of us, we have these desires in us. We have deep, strong desires that, that we should stand on. You know, Jesus is, is the rock of our salvation. We, we should stand on that. Serve the Lord, we should stand on that. But then you have loud desires. And sometimes we think that loud desires are the more important desires, but they're just simply the loudest desires in, in, in your ear. So for instance here, please take this cup of suffering away from me. That's a loud desire in the ear of Jesus. Like, man, get out of this. We can get out of this. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. That, that's a deep desire. On, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a profound desire that Jesus is standing on, that he's saying, like, even though this is loud, I'm going to stay standing on this. When, when I was younger, like last year, no, I'm just kidding, a lot younger, you know, back when I was like in high school, college age, I invited a lot of friends to church, a, a lot of friends to church. A lot of my friends came to church, guys, girls, a lot, a lot of people came to church. And I saw, I was a witness, would invite my friends to church, and I would say that for some of them, that was their first time in church ever, any kind of church. 
For others, it was their first time in an evangelical church, in a Christian church. And I saw many of my friends, guys and girls, first time at church, ball out, start crying. They had some type of experience with, with God. I, some, some might say it was a spiritual experience. Some might say it was an emotional experience. I don't know. I just know they had an experience with God. They would like ball out. And then I would talk to them later or afterwards. And they would, um, they would tell me like, man, I felt God. Right? Some would say that. Some would say, I felt God. Some would say, man, I felt this peace. Like this peace. I felt this peace. Others would say, like, man, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. I just felt it, it was so beautiful. Like, 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 it felt so beautiful, right? So felt beautiful, felt this peace, felt God. Some, somewhere along those lines, they would describe it. So then I would tell them, man, that's awesome. Come back next week. Come back next week. You're the one saying that that's how you felt. You're the one who had this experience. Come back next week. The vast majority of them did not come back. Or maybe they came back the following week, but then that was it. They never came back. 99.9% of them never came back. Why? Later on, I'll make time, you know, hanging out, talking, start talking about spiritual matters. I would be like, man, you know, remember that time you went to church and you were crying and you had that experience? Yeah. And then I would say, like, why haven't you come back? And, and, and this was like the, the, this was kind of, these two answers were like the answers for, for pretty much everybody. One is that they would say something like this. They would say like, well, it's because if I start going to church, right? So they equate church with serving God, right? So, so it's not just about coming to church. But if I start going to church, if I start serving God, my friends, they're not going to hang out with me anymore. Or my family, they might reject me. And, 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 and I'm going to be lonely, right? So there was the, the desire, a deep desire to serve God, but then there was a loud desire that, hey, I don't want to be lonely, I don't want my friends to reject me, or I don't want, you know, um, I don't want to lose my friends, or, or I don't want to lose my family, like, like you know, and, and, and so then they would go with that desire because it's so loud in their ear. Uh, others of my friends, they live the party life, like they live the party life. I, I, was, I was having lunch with the pastor yesterday, and I was telling him, I was like, you know, some of my friends in high school, now that I'm older and I understand things, like I would consider them alcoholics. They weren't alcoholics like drink every day, beat up, you know, your, your wife kicked a dog type of alcoholics, but they were alcoholics. I consider someone that cannot be around liquor and not drink. I mean, you're an alcoholic. If, if there's liquor, if there's alcohol, there's a beer, whatever, and you cannot just be like, oh, I'm cool, you know, like you have to drink, you, you're probably an alcoholic. And uh, they were so used to the party life Partying, clubbing, going to, um, you know, in my parents, they, they called them cantinas, but now to make it fancy, make it sound nice, they call it lounge, right? So they're going to the lounges, right? I too bien fancy. You know, parents, your kid tells you they're going to a lounge, they're going to a cantina, just has a nice sofa, but they're going to a cantina. They're just letting you know, all right? They, they lounge, I, I too calmate, right? You know, like that. And so, so anyway... They're so used to that life. The deep desire was to serve God, come to church, serve God. But the loud desire was like, man, if I start going to church, if I get straight with God, I start taking this stuff serious, serving the Lord. Like, I, I'm not going to party anymore. I'm not going to be with my friends anymore. I'm not going to have a good time anymore. Like, I'm gonna, man, it's going to be boring. Like, life is going to be boring. And, 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 and I'm going to become bitter, right? You know, or whatever. And so that, those were the, and, 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 and that's what they would fall into. And so they would stop coming to church or they didn't return to church. Right now, those two voices are rising in your ear. Right? They're whispering, they're talking. One of them is whispering and one of them is yelling. Right? You see the love that God has for you. He sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You see the love that Jesus has for you, that he was willing to not only endure physical suffering, but to endure something that he would... He had never endured to be separated from the Father's love because he took on the wrath of the Father. You see that the Father loves you and that he loves you and hates 
others, right? Or hates other things, right? So you see, you, you see that. But then there's the part of you like, man, I want, I want to stand on, on that. I want to serve God. I want to come to church. I want to live the Christian life. I want to be all about that Christian life, right? You know, like, like I, want to, I want to be right with the Word. I want to be in the Bible. But then there's like, but what about your friends? But what about partying? Right? But what about your, your physical urges? But what about, and, and man, that just starts getting louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. Now, why did Jesus endure everything that he endured? Love, right? Love. Now, I'm not asking, because I know if I asked, everybody would raise your hand. But if I ask, I'm not asking, so don't raise your hand. If I asked, who here loves God? I think everybody would raise their hand. That's why you're here on a Sunday, you know, at a 12 p.m. service right? When I was thinking, what are some of the benefits of coming to Pueblo's church at 12 p.m.? One of the number one benefits is that when you go to the restaurant, the line will be gone, right? You know, so, so thank God for Pueblo's at 12 p.m., right? I asked you, do you love God? You raise your hand. Well, you know, we have a saying, don't tell me, show me. I asked my wife, do you love me? And she says, yes. I'm like, don't tell me, show me. And so she's like, fine. She's like, here's two daughters and one on the way, right? A baby on the way. We don't know if it's boy or girl, right? You know, like that, so, right? Rubensito on the way, right? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praying times 10, right? You know, like that for a boy. Amen. How are you showing it? How are you proving it? Remember, we're disciples of Jesus, followers of the life of Jesus. How did Jesus demonstrate his love for us and his dem demonstrated his love for the Father? Obedience. Obedience. And the way you and I express our love for the Father is obedience. Amen. It's not enough to just say, oh, I love God. It's not enough to, to come to church once a week, hour and a half, and then the rest of the, the week to live like the devil himself. Right? It's not enough. No, no, no obedience and you will not be able to be obedience out of your own effort or your own strength but you will be able to be obedient out of love Amen. remind yourself the father loves me and I love the father Jesus loves me and I love Jesus and you will be able to find obedience the strength to be obedient in love there's a verse, that, and I'll finish with this, that says about Jesus. He was obedient and obedient unto death and death of the cross. Right? Why? Because he loved us and he loved the Father. Let's close our Bibles. And I want to invite you to bow your head and in, in prayer, thank God that you're here today. You, you made time to come to church today. Start, start thanking the Lord that you're here today. Thank you, Father, that I'm here today. Father, thank you that we came to Pueblo's church. Thank you, Father, that we praise you and we worship you. We thank you, Father. If your family is here with you, thank God that your family is here with you. That's a tremendous blessing. Father, I thank you that my sister, my brother-in-law, my nephews are here. I thank you that my nieces are here. Thank you that my wife, my daughters are here. I thank you my mom is here. Thank you my dad came earlier and... Ronnie came last night. Will you thank the Father that he's here? Say, thank you, Father, that you're here. Abba, Father, thank you for your presence this afternoon. Now, I'm going to ask you in prayer to say something that you probably haven't ever said or you haven't said in a long time. Will you tell Abba, Father, that you love him? Say, Abba, Father, I love you. Abba, Father, I love you. Oh, my heavenly Father, I want you to know that I love you. And I love you, I love you. I accept your love. I receive the love you have for me. But I want you to know that I love you too. I love you. My heavenly Father, I love you, I love you. Will you ask the Lord to give you the strength to walk in obedience because you love him? 
Say, Father, give me the strength to walk in obedience because I love you. I thank you that you love me and I want you to know I love you. And I pray, Lord, that you would give me the strength to walk in obedience out of love. Thank you, Father, that Jesus suffered on my behalf. And sometimes we suffer with temptation. But give me the strength to be obedient through love. Father God, I put Pueblo's church in your hands. I thank you that we praise, worship you. I thank you for the teaching of your word. But I ask, Father, that you would strengthen us in your ways. Help us to live out lives that prove, that show that we love you, that we are lovers of God, that we love you, our heavenly Father, because of what you have done for us, because of what you have provided for us, because you have saved us, because you have healed us. And I pray, Lord, that you would renew our minds, transform our hearts. You have begun a good work in us. Continue that good work that we would bring you honor, glory, and praise with the lives that we live. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen.